يخشى تنزيلا من خلق الأرض والسماوات العلا الرحمن على العرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى وإن تجهر بالقول فإن يعلم السر وأخفى الله لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء الحسنى وهل أتاك حديث موسى إذ رأى نارا فقال لأهلهم كثوا إني آنست نارا إن أو أجد أو أجد على النار هدى فلما أتاها نودي يا موسى إني أنا ربك فاخلع نعليك إنك بالواد إنك بالواد المقدس قوى وأنا اخترتك فاستمع لما يوحى إنني أنا الله لا إله إلا أنا فاعبدني فاعبدني وأقم الصلاة لذكري إن الساعة آتية أكاد أخفيها لتجزى لتجزى كل نفس تسعى فلا يصدنك عنها من لا يؤمن بها من لا يؤمن بها واتبع هواه فتردى وما تلك بيمينك يا موسى قال هي عصاي اتوكا عليها واهش بها على غنمي واهش بها على غنمي ولي فيها مآرب أخرى قال ألقها يا موسى فألقاها فإذا هي حية تسعى قال خذها ولا تخف سنعيدها سيرتها الأولى واضمم يدك إلى جناحك تخرج بيضاء من غير سوء آية أخرى لنريك من آياتنا الكبرى اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى قال رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من أهلي هارون أخي اشدد به ازري واشركه في امري كي نسبحك كثيرا ونذكرك كثيرا انك كنت بنا بصيرا. اوكي. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. <تصفيق> حمد كثيرا طيبا مبارك فيك ما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد Thank you guys for joining me this morning Alhamdulillah for another morning remembrances <coughs> Uh, this morning, um, I want to talk to the brothers and the sisters about something important. All right. Um, there is a hadith that we're going to cover this morning. And I want you guys to just listen to this hadith. I want you guys to listen 
to the, the what was said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded. <clears throat> this hadith is for the brothers and the sisters. All right. For the brothers and the sisters. So listen closely to what is going to happen here, inshallah. On the authority of Asma bintu Yazid al Ansariyah, this hadith was narrated on the authority of Asma bintu Yazid. She was an Ansari. And the purpose of me mentioning that she was from the Ansar and not from the Muhajirat. Is because the Ansar, their, their their characteristics were a lot different than the women of Mecca. All right, Umar radiAllahu he gave us a, a little detail into that. Umar said, "Nahnu ma'ashara al ma'ashara Quraysh, kunna naghdibu nisa'ana." Giving us some cultural context. Umar radiAllahu in one narration, he said, "We, the people of Mecca, the men of Mecca of Quraysh." We were more aggressive and more assertive than our women. We were more aggressive and more assertive than our women. He said, فَلَمَّا انْتَقَلْنَا إِلَى مَدِينَةً وَجَدْنَا الْأَنْصَارِ أَنَّ النِّسَاءَ يَغْلِبْنَا الرِّجَالِ He said, but when we migrated from Mecca to Medina, we found the Ansar to be the type of people who their women were more aggressive than the men. Their women were more aggressive than the men. He said, and lo and behold, <clears throat> our women started to assimilate the same behavior. Meaning those of the Muhajirat who migrated from Mecca to Medina, when they got to Medina and they saw how aggressive and how assertive the women were in Medina, the women from Mecca started to become the same way. All right. Give you a little cultural context here. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, Hal tatazawwaj min al-ansar? Would you ever marry a woman from the Ansar? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La, he said, no. He said, because ashaddu ghira, the, the women from the Ansar are extremely jealous women. They're very assertive, you know, uh, very assertive, very jealous women. You understand? <clears throat> so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was you know, sold on the idea that he would never marry from the women of the Ansar. It just wasn't his preference. And Fi'lin, he never married any of the women from the Ansar. You know, um, and some women are just, you know, built like that, you know, and that's just the person's personal preferences. Nothing against the women. It's just that you knowing, you know what I mean? Like you knowing yourself and you knowing your own threshold. And that is very important. If you know that you can't handle a certain type of woman, then it would be wise of you as a man not to, you know, not to try your hand, you know, marrying a woman from a certain culture. If you know your limitations, if you know your threshold, then it would be wise of you as a man, as well as as a woman. If you know you can't handle being with a certain type of man, you know you can't handle being with a certain caliber of men, then it would be wise of you, regardless of how they look, because looks change everything for many people. We'll say no, no, no. And then when the right person pops up, all of those standards go out the window. It's like, yeah, but weren't you the same person that was saying that you would never marry a woman like this or ma never marry a man like that? But then when the right man pops in or the right woman pops up, it's like all those standards go out the window. The Prophet Sallallahu was asked, would you ever marry one of the women of the Ansar? And he said, no. These women are extremely jealous. I'm sorry. I, I can't deal with that. You understand? I can't deal with that. Uh, not only were they extremely jealous, but they were also very uh, assertive, as we will see. So when I say this hadith was on the authority of Asma bintu Yazid al-Ansariya, she was from the Ansar. You know, so I'm, I'm trying to give you some backstory so you understand when you see how this situation plays out, you will understand why. All right. Asma bintu Yazid al-Ansariya. Annaha atat nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa min bayni ashabihi. Asma bintu Yazid, she went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was amongst his companions. So there's a whole group of men just sitting around laughing, talking. I want to paint a picture for you. 
All right, the Prophet Sallallahu is sitting with his companions. We're talking about these big, huge men, big beards, you understand, sitting around laughing, talking, you know. And here comes this woman in the midst of these men. As you can see from the women of the Ansar, very assertive, right? In a normal instance, the women wouldn't have just walked up in between the men like that. The woman would have usually waited to catch the Prophet Sallallahu by himself. But this woman walked up in front of a crowd of men because what she had to say was that important. All right. What she had to ask the Prophet Sallallahu was that important. All right. So I want you to pay attention. All right. So just imagine the Prophet Sallallahu with his uncle Abbas, with, you know, Abdurrahman ibn Auf and, you know, some of the companions. And they're just sitting around talking. These, these were huge men, big men. You understand? Big beards, you know, sitting around, you know, campfire, talking, laughing. You know, I want I want to paint that picture for you. Right. And here comes this woman. You know, the Islamic, you know, etiquettes of modesty, you know, Islamic etiquettes of modesty, bashfulness, shyness, you know, all of that. Right. She pulled up. Absolutely. In, in our in our modern vernacular. Yes, she pulled up. Because what she had to say was that important. So the Prophet ﷺ is amongst his companions and this woman walks right up to him. Even in the situation of the hadith where the woman walked up to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him, did he want to marry her? And Asma, uh, I mean, um, um, uh, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, um Salama was standing there and she covered her face and she said, how, is embar how embarrassing is it for you to walk up to a man and ask him, does he want to get married? Like, you know, and walk up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, how embarrassing is this? So, and Um Salama was from the Muhajirat, you know, keep in mind. So they had a different level of modesty. It wasn't, it didn't mean that the Ansari women were not modest. They had just a different understanding of modesty. You go to different environments, you go to different places, and people express modesty differently. It's not that they don't have any modesty. It's just that their understanding and their expectation or, or their expression of modesty is a lot different. Same thing with love. You know, you might marry a woman from this family or that family, and the way that they express love is completely different. And that is very important for you as a man or as a woman to know your own love language and to know how you like to be loved so that you can express that to the person ahead of time so that you know that the person can meet your expectations. Some of us, we want to be loved in a, in a way where our spouses are not qualified or not suited to be able to, you know, to, to suffice us. And then you're wondering why, you know, you're married to this person and you are requesting that this person love you in a certain way. And the person is not doing it because somebody who doesn't have something can't give you what they don't have. You are requesting something from somebody that they can't give to you. And you should have known that ahead of time. You should have thought about that ahead of time. That's a discussion that you should have had ahead of time. And that's why it's important for you to know what your love language is and to be able to articulate that to the person so that they know ahead of time that this is what I require in a relationship. This is what I require in a marriage. This is the way that I want to be loved. You can't just allow people to come into your life and love you the way that they are comfortable loving you. That That's fine. But also, let me explain to you, if you, you know, it's like when you buy something from the store and it comes with a manual, it comes with a set of instructions. You understand? It comes with a set of instructions. Those instructions teach you how to work the device. Our love language teaches you how to work us. You, you want to know how to work me? Understand what my love language is. When you understand my love language, you figured me out. <laughs> you know what makes me tick. You know what gets me motivated. You, you know now. So this woman from the Ansar... She goes to the Prophet Sallallahu while he is amongst his companions, right? And she walks up to him and she says, Be abi anta wa ummi. She said, by my, uh, 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 May my mother and my father be ransomed for you. This is like the entry to a conversation, a very humble way of introducing the conversation that is very important. Be abi anta wa ummi. 
May my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. Meaning, I don't mean any disrespect. I don't mean, you know, to offend you in any way or pop, any way, shape or uh, any way. Right? Be a be unto wa ummi. This is how you introduce a conversation with humility. Right? She says, May my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. Inni wafida tun nisa ilayk. I am a, a delegate. I am just one woman sent to you by a group of women. Meaning I am speaking to you on behalf of a whole group of women who feel exactly the way I feel. I am speaking to you as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, on behalf of all of the women that are behind me. Right? She said, وَأَعْلَمُ نَفْسِي أَنِّي مَا مِنْ إِمْرَأَةٍ كَائِنًا فِي الشَّرْقِ وَلَا غَرَبٍ سَمِعْتُ سَمِعَتْ بِمَخْرِجِ هَذَا إِلَّا وَهِيَ عَلَى مِثْرِ رَأْيِ She said that there is no woman who has heard that I was coming to speak to you, whether in the East or the West, except that they hold the same opinion that I hold right now. They hold the same opinion that I hold right now. No woman, right? She's representing a whole group of women. There's no woman who heard me on my way to come speak to you today, whether in the East or in the West, except that they feel the exact same way that I feel right now. She's speaking on behalf of all women. She's speaking on behalf of all women. And, you know, the bold steps that she took to to make change, to bring about some type of change, that means that women were having a discussion about this. Women in the background were discussing these things. And so while we see a lot of podcasts, we see a lot of discussions about problems in the Muslim community, we need solution-oriented sisters. Sitting around talking about what brothers are not doing, sitting around talking about how brothers are marrying second wives and can't afford it, sitting around talking about, you know, why the condition of our ummah is this way or that way, that's that's fine. I mean, we are we are traumatized. I get it. But sitting around constantly talking about the problem without providing a solution is asinine, in, in, in my opinion. It's asinine. What's the solution? Creating all of these podcasts, creating all of these talk shows, what is the solution? You guys seem like you are so encapsulated by the problems that exist in the Muslim community. These problems have always existed and these problems will always exist. They will always exist. Islam did not come to rid of and eradicate problems. Islam did not come to eradicate problems. Problems existed during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu There was zina, there were a couple of incidents of, you know, adultery. There were incidents, you know, children born out of wedlock. There were incidents where people, even after the prohibition of alcohol, there were still people who used to drink. You understand? Islam did not come to eradicate the problems. Islam came to do what? To provide solutions to the problems. And if we're sitting around just constantly beating down, it, you're like it's like, okay, I get it. We get it. The men ain't nothing. The men can't afford polygyny. Men ain't this. Men ain't that. Brothers ain't this. Brothers ain't that. Okay, what's the solution? What's the solution? What is the solution? So just as a as a as a gentle reminder, as we get on these podcasts, as we get on these different social media sites, start becoming more solution oriented. Start becoming more solution oriented. I get it. Speaking about the problems help you to, you know, to vent. It helps you to, you know, get get some of this stuff off of your chest. We carrying a lot. I get it. Trust me. But at the same token, we also want to be solution oriented. We want to provide solutions. Now, this woman clearly came to speak to the Prophet Wasallam on behalf of all of the other women. So what I what I am proposing is that all of you women. 
that have so much to say about what's going on in the Muslim community. Why don't we create a major platform where you guys can select, you know, maybe three or four women, three or four or five sisters who represent the larger Muslim women community and then have some scholars or like minded men, you know, and then we create a platform and we figure out how you understand we figure out how to solve this problem. We we figure out how to solve this solve this problem because this person over here talking about it, this person over here, that's not going to solve the problem. We just become like, you know, disgruntled Muslims who can't seem to get their ish together. That that's what we look like from the outside. But this woman clearly, after speaking to the, the larger body of women in the Muslim community, decided, OK, these are our issues. I'm going to talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to we need to figure this out. She said, there's no woman who heard that I was coming to speak to you today, except that they see it exactly the way that I'm seeing it. <laughs> All right. She said, well, I am there's no woman who heard that I was coming out to talk to you today, except whether in the East or the West, except that they see the situation exactly the way I see it. I'm, and I mean, we have a list of issues. Marriage is just one of them. Education is another Community is another. Vision, direction, where we're going in the next five years. We're not talking about people who are lost. We're talking about like-minded people. We sit around and just vent about the problems over and over and over again. And it doesn't like you just, we're not solving the problem. Some of us just get, you know, we get off on just talking about the problem. That's it. But we need solutions. Mental health issues. Yes, absolutely. How do we move forward after our community has taken such a hit? Exactly. This is exactly what Shaitan wants. This is how he keeps us divided. And, and part... Part of the reason why we can't do that is because we have allowed resentment to settle in. So now you have groups of sisters who resent the brothers, who hate the brothers. And you have brothers on the same side of brothers who resent sisters and hate the sisters. And this is how we have become divided. You have a group from amongst us who make it their duty to shame, bash, and destroy the, the, the small group of good men that we actually have left. From amongst the sisters. All, they put all of the brothers in one bracket. <laughs> all of the brothers are horrible. The Muslim community is, you know, it's like all of them. All of the brothers. There's not one single brother, married brother that I know of personally, except that he is handling his business as a man. I, I, I don't have I don't have those type of brothers in my circle, period. I don't associate. I don't communicate with brothers who are not handling their business. I surround myself with people that I like to think as are a reflection of me and I am a reflection of them. I'm sorry. I don't know those brothers, which is why when I'm speaking, those brothers are not included in my discussion. So when I'm talking about brothers doing the right thing or whatever, and you know, people are like, well, where are those brothers at? They're around. I don't associate with these brothers that y'all keep bringing up into our discussions. Well, what about the brothers who do this? Or what about the brothers who do that? I don't know those brothers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you were introduced to those brothers, but I don't know those brothers. I'm just being 100 with you. I don't know those brothers. What about brothers who do this and the brothers who over here doing that? I don't know those brothers. I don't know them. I'm sorry. They are a non-factor. The scholars in Usul al-Fiqh, they have a principle. A nadir la hukum la. That something that is a rarity, no ruling is assigned to something that is rare. No ruling is assigned to something that is rare. 
You guys are talking about minorities. You're not talking about the majority of Muslim men. You're talking about a, a small minority of Muslim men. They are not included. They are not a factor in our discussion. When we're talking about men, when we're talking about what men do, those brothers are not a factor in what we're talking about. So stop saying, well, what about the brothers who do that? Or what about the brothers who do that? I don't know those brothers. I don't know those brothers. So she comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam and she says, Inna Allah ba'athaka bil haqq ila rijali wa nisa. She said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you, O Messenger of Allah, to the men and to the women. This is this woman, Asma. She's talking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you to the men and the women. Inna Allah ba'athaka bil, uh, bil haqq ila rijali wa nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you to the men and to the women. And another narration, listen to what she said. Qalat ya Rasulullah, Rabbul Rijal wa Rabbul Nisa Allah. She said, Allah is the Lord of the men and Allah is the Lord of the woman, of the women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbul Rijal wa Rabbul Nisa. Allah is the Lord of the men and the Lord of the women. Wa Adam Abu Rijal wa Abu Nisa. And Adam is the father of the men and the father and the father of the women. Wa Hawa. Umm al-Rijal wa umm al-Nisa. And Hawa, Eve, is the mother of the men and the mother of the women. Allah is the Lord of the men and the women. Adam is the father of the men and the women. And Hawa is the mother of the men and the women. You understand? She said, Wa ba'athaka wa inna Allah ba'athaka azza wa jal ila al-Rijal wa nisa And Allah sent you to the men and the women. Listen to her introduction. That's just her introduction. Pay attention to what she says. She said, فَآمَنَّا بِكَ وَبِإِلَهِكَ الَّذِي أَرَسَلَكَ She said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you to the men and to the women. And we, the women, she's speaking on behalf of the women. She said, فَآمَنَّا بِكَ And we believed in you. فَآمَنَّا بِكَ we, we women, we believed in you. And we believed in the Lord who sent you. He said, and we women, we are, we preserve our chastity. We preserve our chastity for our husbands. I want the men to listen to this. Because you can hear the frustration in her voice. And I'm sure that many women listening right now, you, you feel her pain. You feel exactly what she's getting ready to say, even before I finished her sentence. You feel it. She said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the men and the Lord of the women. Adam is the father of the men and the father of the women. Hawa is the mother of the men and the mother of the women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you, O prophet, as a prophet to the men and to the women. She said, we women, when you were sent, we believed in you. We believed in you and we believed in the Lord that sent you. She said, we women, we are mahsurat. We preserve our chastity. I would like to think that the vast majority of sisters in the community preserve their chastity. Stop me when I'm lying. I would like to believe that the vast majority of Muslim women in the Muslim community preserve their chastity. There may be hiccups here and there, you know, a picture slips out here, a conversation takes a deadly turn over there. But for the most part, our women are not just out here sleeping around with men. I would like to think that. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows me, takes my soul while those are the good thoughts that I have about the Muslim community. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes my soul while those are the good thoughts that I have about my community. You understand? 
Because if we say that Muslim women are out here just sleeping around or whatever, man, the community is gone. It's, there's no sense in us even talking about any solutions to anything because the moment we lose sight of our moral compass, everything else collapses on top of it. So I would like to think that the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of Muslim women preserve their chastity. And in comparison to what we see out here in the world, I don't know a group of women. I don't know any society, any group of women that are surrounded by the type of debauchery that we are surrounded by here in America that manages to maintain their chastity and maintain themselves morally like Muslim women. Correct me when I'm wrong. Correct me when I'm wrong. So then... For Muslim men, what is the problem? What is the problem? She said, Nahnu ma'ashara, inna ma'ashara mahsurat. She said, We women, we women, we preserve our chastity. Maqsurat. And we only have eyes for our husbands. We only have eyes for our husbands. We only beautify ourselves for our husbands. Muslim women come outside. Even if the hijab is not, you know, the, the, you know, the traditional understanding of the hijab. Muslim women, for the most part, still try to maintain some level of modesty. Their beauty is for their husbands. Even if a woman dresses a bit provocative as a Muslim one, woman, when she gets married, a lot of times that stuff changes. A lot of times it changes. 99.9% .9 of the time, that changes. She might be a little loose when she's single, but when she gets married, she is ready to change that. Correct me when I'm wrong. Those things do change. May not change overnight, but there is an intention to change because she does realize that I am married now and I have, a, I have, another, I have another level of responsibility. Right, because you feel validated now. You don't, you don't need the outside. You don't need the external validation. You're getting it now. So when we are looking at social media, and you know, it pains me sometimes to scroll through Instagram and see Muslim women dressed in a certain way. It, it does. It does. But I get it. I get it. I, I totally get it. I, I understand. Social media, attention has become the new currency. I got it. But you, as a woman, have to constantly remind yourself that validation is internal, not external. It's internal, not external. Validation comes from God. Validation become, comes as a result of your relationship with God. You understand? What did Zahir ibn Haram, what did he say to the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet said, who will buy the slave? And Zahir said, nobody would buy me. I'm, I'm worthless goods. He said, you would find me worthless goods. Nobody would purchase me, right? And then what does the Prophet ﷺ say to him? He said, Bel anta He said, no, to Allah, you are priceless. To Allah, to God, you are priceless. The world may see you as less than. The world may see you as that. But to God, you are priceless. You understand? True validation comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I get it. I get it. And what would help? What would help is that when you see a sister posting, when you let, let me just give the sisters, let me give you some advice, right? When you see a sister's post on Facebook, Instagram, and you've seen her, you see her dressed in a manner where you know it is unbefitting of a Muslim woman. To dress like that. Right? When you see that, rather than saying, Astaghfirullah, you know, this, that, why don't you shoot the sister a DM and say, Sis, you are beautiful. You're beautiful. Not because of what you have on in your picture, but you are beautiful. You understand? Validate her. When you see a person that is struggling for validation, give them that. Why do we make people, and this is African Americans, we are so hard to impress. We make people work for our validation when it should just be given freely. 
We should give that. When you see a person struggling for validation, you in a room full of people, you see the loudest person in the room looking for that attention, fall back. Fall back. I, I see you over there. I see you. You know, I see you struggling for the validation, right? Something so powerful. Not that I'm, I'm into it, but I saw the picture of Michelle, you know, pointing at Kamala and Kamala's like, you know, we all seen that picture. That was very powerful, man. That's from one woman to another woman, validating her. Like, I see you. I see you. You got this. And she's like, thank you. You know, thank you. It's my time. It's my time. You understand? She gave her that validation. And I want you sisters to be able to do that. When you scroll past a picture and you see a sister, you know, showing a little bit more than what's necessary or what's, you know, what she should be showing, shoot her a DM. Sis, I, I see you. You know what I mean? Like, I see you. You understand? Be kind, right? Be kind. Be gentle. I, I, I see you. I, I, I see you. You know, you, you're, trying to get your, you're trying to get some validation. I get it. You ain't even got to say anything about the picture, but just say, oh, hey, you beautiful, man. I see you. And it ain't got nothing to do with your picture. But I'm, I'm giving you that on GP. You're my sister in Islam. I'm, I'm seeing you. You understand? Rather than scrolling past the picture, I stuck for the law. I ooze to be lied. And brothers, I'm not talking about brothers. Brothers, don't send a sister a DM telling her she's beautiful. Don't do that. This is not for the men. This is for the women. This is for the women. Men should not be sending any sister a DM telling her, sis, you beautiful. No, because now you are contributing to the problem. So, she says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna Allaha ila rijali wa nisa. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent you to the men, sent you with the truth to men and women. Fa'amanna bik, and we believed in you. As women, we believed in you. Wa bi ilahi kalladhi arasalak. And we believed in the Lord we believe in the Lord who sent you. <inaudible> we women, we preserve our chastity. <inaudible> we only have eyes for our husbands. <inaudible> we stay in your homes. We occupy your homes. We stay in the home. We don't come outside unless necessary. We stay in the home. You're not going to find Muslim women out on the street corner chilling, talking on the street, on the stoop. Now, nah, Muslim women, they're in their homes. Their homes are their kingdoms. That's their domain. We stay in your homes. We satisfy your desires. We satisfy your desires. I've never seen a Muslim man come to me and complain to me that his wife is not, you know, sexually fulfilling his, his needs. I, I have never seen that. But I have seen the opposite. I have seen sisters complain that their husbands are not satisfying their sexual needs. I, I have seen that. But I have never seen one brother complain to me, send me an email, send me a DM. My wife is not engaging me sexually. I've never seen that. I have never seen that. She said, Kawaii buyutikum, we stay in your homes. And we satisfy your desires. We satisfy your desires. Doesn't matter what time of day it is. Like we could be breastfeeding, we hold in one child on the breast, and we're trying to, you know, trying to engage our husband, trying to let him know that, you know, I still, you know, let me put this child to bed and I got you. You know what I mean? This this is our wives. These these are our women. Not in the mood, but still trying to satisfy you. Tell me I'm lying. Tell me I'm lying. This this happens. Makdi shahwatikum, hamilat oladikum, and we carry your children. We carry your babies. We carry your children. What does she say? We believed in you, and your Lord that sent you. We. Preserve our chastity. We only have eyes for our husbands. We beautify ourselves for our, for our husbands. We stay in our homes. We satisfy your desires. Hamilet oladikum. We carry your children. 
We carry your children. <laughs> I'm saying this as a man who has, I'm in the teens with my children. You understand? I'm in the teens with my children. So I've seen my wives have multiple children for me. You understand? And no matter how difficult arguments and disagreements get, you when you think back to the moment that your wife is sitting on that bed struggling to push your child out into the world, why is that not enough for you as a man to pump your brakes before the next words that come out of your mouth are, I'm putting you in or I'm divorcing you? How does that flow out of our mouths so easily after seeing that? How does that flow out of our mouths so easy? How? How does I divorce you because of a disagreement, because of an argument, because of a heated argument? Do we just terminate the entire marriage after having seen this woman push your children child after child after child after child push out into the world? How? Is there no loyalty? Is it? I'm talking to the men, brothers, listen to me. Is there no loyalty? Did you not see that woman on the gurney pushing your child, struggling to push your child out into the world? Or having surgery? <laughs> Subhanallah, man. Where is the loyalty? Man. She said, Hamilat Oladikum, we carry your children. She said, and even though we do all of that, you men, she's speaking to the men now. She said, إِنَّكُمْ مَعْشَرَ الرِّجَالِ You men, فَضَّلْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا بِالْجُمُعَ وَالْجَمَعَاتِ She said, even though we do all of this, you men, you have a greater virtue than we do because you go to Jumu'a, you go to Salatul Jama'a, you pray Jumu'a in, in the masjid. You pray Salatul Jama'ah, you pray in the masjid five times a day. For those of the men who can get to the masjid five times a day. The Muslim women don't have to go to Jumu'ah. Muslim women do not have to go to Salatul Jama'ah. But the Muslim men do. The Muslim men do. But you have a virtue over us in that you go to Jumu'ah, you go to Salatul Jama'ah, you pray in the masjid five times a day. Wa'iyadatul marda, and you get to go visit the sick. And you go to the janazah prayer where the women have been prohibited from going to the janazah. And you make hajj after hajj. I know brothers, wallahi, who have made hajj after hajj after hajj. And obviously the woman can't make hajj every single time. She has children, she, has, she might be pregnant. There are tons of different things going on. But men, we have that luxury. What she's referring to is the luxury that we have as men. That's what she's referring to. She's referring to the luxury that men have. That you guys get to go to Jumu'ah every Friday. You get to go to Salatul Jama'ah every time the Adhan goes off. You're running to the masjid to go pray. Right? You get to go visit the sick. Your homie in the hospital. You know, you get to go visit him. Uh, you get to go to the janazah prayers. Sometimes you go to a janazah prayer and the sister side is not even open. You can't even get into the masjid. There is no sister side. You understand? Yes, it's a privilege. Almost like the dean was catered to us. That is what she is referring to. She's looking at the situation like this seems unfair. It seems like this is an imbalance. We do all of the hard work. We satisfy your desires. We stay in the home. We preserve our chastity. There are many women who know that they are extremely beautiful and who know, as I said time and time again, brothers, the only reason why many of our wives are with us is because that's their choice. We smell ourselves sometimes thinking that I'm handsome. I can have one. A man cannot have any woman that he wants, but a woman can have any man she wants. A woman can have any man she wants. A man cannot have any woman that he wants. You understand? It, it takes a while before a mature man understands that. A woman can have any man she wants. I don't care what she look like. But a man cannot have any woman that he wants. Doesn't work like that. So 
Keep in mind, if a woman is, you know, covering herself, your wife covers. Some of you women cover, but some of you women have a past before covering. And it would probably be best that you not expose that to your husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? But she's looking at it like, you know, it's a it's an imbalance here. She said, you guys make hajj after hajj. And she said, and greater than all of this, you guys get to go fight in the cause of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, Aisha asked the Prophet ﷺ, Hal jihad ala nisa, do women have to go fight jihad? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, al hajj wal umrah. Yeah, your jihad is hajj and umrah. Go perform hajj, that's your jihad. You understand? If a woman can make hajj one time in her life, you that is your jihad. Getting around the Kaaba with 2.5 million Muslims trying to get around the Kaaba, trying to kiss the black stone, trying to run between Safa and Marwa, that's your jihad. You don't have to fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has sufficed you. That Allah has sufficed the Muslim women from fighting. Your jihad is different. Your jihad as a Muslim woman is different. Your jihad is hajj and umrah. Your jihad is ibadah. Your jihad is trying to sift through all of the distractions in your life to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's your jihad. Whereas for men, that comes very easy for us. We can just dump the children off on you. I'm going to the masjid to go pray. We don't actually think about how simple that is for us. We don't, as men, we don't really think about that because it's so normal. It's become so normalized. It's like, babe, watch the kids, I'm, I'm running out to go pray. And it's like, you dump everything on her. That I'm running out to go have you know, dinner with the brothers, inshallah, I'll be back. And we don't think in that moment that we just dump the children on her. Forget what she had to do. Forget anything that she had to do, whether it was wash clothes, whether it was grade papers, whether it was whatever the case may be. <laughs> you understand? It's just so simple for us. And we don't think about that. She said, but you guys, greater than all of this, you guys get to go fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She said, She said, and when a man from amongst you goes out to perform hajj, or perform umrah, or to go spread Islam, she said, we preserve and protect your wealth. And you leave out to go fight, you leave all of your valuables home, we now become the protector, the wali of the home, protecting, guarding in your absence, right? وَغَزَلْنَا لَكُمْ أَثْوَابَكُمْ And we wash your clothes and iron your clothes. وَرَبَيْنَا لَكُمْ أَمْوَالَكُمْ أَوْلَادَكُمْ And we discipline your children and we, you know, direct your children, we nurture your children. She says, so why is it that women do not share in the reward of the men? Why is it that you guys can go out and fight jihad? You guys can go out and pray Jumu'ah. You guys can go out and pray Salatul Jama'ah. You can go to the janazah. You can do everything outside of the home and get all of these great rewards while we women stuck at home watching your children, you know, having your babies, satisfying your sexual desires, why don't we get the same reward? Why is there no equality? That is what she's asking for. She's asking for equality. Why is it that you guys, because you're men, you, make, you get more reward than we do as women when our job is just the same, if not even more? Listen to the Prophet Wasallam's response. Listen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's response. And I'm saying this because I, I see a lot of women are very disgruntled. And maybe looking at Islam as part of the problem. Islam, sisters, is not part of the problem. Islam is the solution. You see some sisters just get so frustrated with Islam 
and with the way the community is and with all of the you know privileges that the brothers have and they turn towards lesbianism they turn towards feminism they start to teeter along those roads start to teeter along those lines becoming frustrated and disgruntled with islam Similar to the sentiment of this woman. Can you see a lot of the similarities? Can you see the similarities between the what the frustration that this woman is experiencing and what many Muslim women are experiencing today with a lack of community, a lack of accountability, the privileges, the unlimited privileges that it seems like the brothers have in the community? You understand? Islam is not part of the problem and running away from Islam is not going to solve your problem teetering along the lines of becoming a feminist is not going to solve your problems it's just going to make you more disgruntled feminism you know the more extreme feminism right is what I'm talking about I'm not talking about feminism in terms of somebody who is advocating for women's rights advocating for women's seat at the table I'm all for that I don't have a problem with that I'm I'm not I'm not intimidated by a woman having a seat at the table. I, I don't I don't have a problem with that. Never did. That doesn't intimidate me. You understand? I'm I'm all for it. But the more extreme types of feminism is where now you have turned the men into your enemies. You have turned the men into your enemies. And and you're pulling all of the Muslim women along with you. As many Muslim women that will listen to you and as many Muslim women you can get to share your sentiment, you're pulling them along with you in this attempt to, to make them hate men and to belittle men and to, you know, emasculate men every opportunity that you get. And they do exist within the Muslim community. They do exist in the Muslim community. And what you don't understand is that that extreme level of feminism is going to take you outside of the fold of Islam. In some instances, we have seen sisters go from wearing full hijab to becoming full-fledged feminists. And now all you wear is a turban and you've become an educator and you're a doctor, you're a PhD, you're a master's degree, and you think that that justifies you you know, but you have exited Islam. You're not even Muslim anymore. Take a look at yourself. You're not even Muslim anymore. Because you have allowed your hatred for men to drive you. Shaitan got you going and you don't even realize it. Nah, they hate men. Because what happens is that they want to, they want to control the narrative. They want to control how men function. And you don't get to control that. They even take issue with things in our religion that has allowed men some of these privileges. They charge Islam. They indict Islam on charges of misogyny. And, you know, these are some of your favorite podcasters. And, you know, yeah, and I mean, the sentiment is real. I'm not knocking the sentiment. The sentiment is real. Listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu said. All right, asking where in the Quran does it say women supposed to cover? Well, if you would have stayed in Islamic studies, if you would have stayed in Islamic school, and you would have actually paid attention when you were in Islamic school, you would have heard the ayat a million times of where it says for Muslim women to cover. And the fact that you have to even ask a question like that, That means that your mother was wrong. All the Muslim women are wrong because they cover. <laughs> it's just like, you got to be kidding me, man. You've got to be kidding me. Where does it say in the Quran that Muslim women are supposed to cover? I wouldn't even dignify that with a response, honestly. <laughs> I wouldn't even dignify it with a response. I'll let you continue believing what you want to believe. All right, Muslim women not supposed to cover. Got it. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, the Quran says, Ya Ya Ma'ashir al Nisa, less to uh Ya Nisa and Nabi, less to Naka Ahadamin and Nisa. O women of the Prophet, you are not like any other women. No, no, I know what you're saying, Sister Sharice. I'm I'm just saying, like, I wouldn't even dignify that with a response. Yeah, but these are the arguments that they come up with, bro. You know, and it's really sad, man. And and what they don't realize is that you are so far outside of the fold of Islam, it's not like Subhanallah. So let me finish. The Prophet Sallallahu after she made this comment, فالتفت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى أصحابه بوجهه كل ثم قال هل سمعتم مقالة امرأة قط أحسن من مسألتها في أمر دينها من هذه. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after hearing this woman say this. The Prophet Sallallahu turned to his companions, right? Mind you, he's still sitting amongst his companions. He turns to his companions and he said, have you guys ever heard a statement of a woman that was more powerful than the question that this woman is asking about her deen? Have you ever heard a, que a, a statement more powerful than the question that this woman is asking about her religion? She's questioning the Prophet Sallallahu the authority of our Ummah. Questioning him, why is it that the men have all of these different privileges and they simply on the basis of being men that they have this virtue over us as women when it looks like what we are doing is, is far more important than what they're doing. We make it possible so that they can do the things that they do. So the Prophet Sallallahu turns to his companions and he said, Have you ever heard a statement of a woman that was more powerful? Listen, look at the validation. Look at how the Prophet Sallallahu is validating her, right? He's validating her in front of the men. You understand? He's validating her in front of the men. Usually when a man is with a bunch of other men, they become very dismissive if the woman tries to say something smart or the woman tries to insert something, you know, into a conversation or tries to check him, you know, in front of other men. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't shrink. He didn't shrink in front of her sentiment. He didn't shrink. And some men do that. When the woman is expressing herself, they just shrink. And then to overcompensate for shrinking, they got to come back even stronger on top of the woman to make her shrink just because they feel insecure in that moment. The Prophet Wasallam said, what you are asking is powerful. He validated her. He didn't shrink in front of her, you know, her sentiment. He didn't shrink in front of her request. And there's some men who do that. The woman comes with a request and the request is valid. It is a valid request. It's a valid sentiment, valid statement. And rather than the man standing in his discomfort in that moment and say, you know what, babe, you're absolutely right. I can't even argue with you on that. You're absolutely right. Rather than just owning it in that moment, we got to come back two times, three times stronger to put you back in your place as a woman. Who are you talking to? You who are you talking to like that? You didn't have to say it like that. You could have you could have did this. You could have did that all to satisfy your own insecurity. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned to his companions and he said, "Have you ever heard a statement of a woman that was as powerful as the question that this woman is asking? Have you ever heard something so powerful?" He validated her right on the spot. Before he even responds to what she's saying, he's validating the sentiment. You understand? I keep telling you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, he was emotional intelligence walking. You understand? He was emotional intelligence walking. They validated her in that moment in front of the other men. Usually when men are around other men and a woman says something, you know, out of the way like that, you know, here again, we got to put her back in her place. But no, the Prophet Sallallahu validated her in front of his own companions. He said, have you guys ever heard something as powerful as this, what this woman is asked? So one of the Sahaba, فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مَا ظَنَنَّ أَنَّ إِمْرَأَةٍ تُهْتَدَى إِلَى مِثْلِ هَذَا 
One of the Sahaba says, O Messenger of Allah, we never thought a woman could be, be guided to such articulation. <laughs> look, at, look at how they downplay. The Prophet Sallallahu is the balance in that situation. He's the balance. He's the balance in that situation. One of the Sahaba said, we never thought that a woman could you know, be guided to articulate herself like that. <laughs> that, that was deep. <laughs> But it was kind of condescending a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was kind of condescending a little bit because it's almost like, so are you saying that women are not articulate? You understand? It, it was kind of condescending, but it shows you why the Prophet Wasallam chose to deal with it in front of them. Because this woman is making the complaint towards the men, the equality, what seems like the lack of equality. And the Prophet Sallallahu only felt that it's right that we hold court right here. We hold court right here. Ain't no need to take you to the side and deal with it over here. Well, let me talk to you over here. No, no, we're going to have the conversation right here. Let's hold court in the street right here. You understand? Right. It's like we didn't know women had brains, right? <laughs> you understand? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is holding court right there in the street. No, it's no, he could have said, well, let me talk to you over here about that. <laughs> No, you asked in public, let's have the conversation in public. Let's have it right here, right now. Let's do it right here. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam filled Tafat and the the Prophet ﷺ, he turned towards the woman and he said, In Sarifi He said, Woman, go ahead back. Go go ahead home and tell all of the women that share your sentiment that I said, <laughs> that I said. That a woman being a good wife, and the husna taba'un, a woman being a good wife to her husband, seeking you know his pleasure by by doing so, and seeking to you know be uh, uh, to be reasonable with him. It is equivalent to all of the rewards that basically saying that the woman being a good wife, and you know, trying to please her husband, it is equivalent to all of the reward that the men get when they go out and fight jihad, they go to Jumu'ah, they go to Salatul Jama'ah. It's equivalent to all of that. Just being a good wife. So for the women who look at their husbands who get to go make Hajj, you go to make Umrah, you go to Jumu'ah, you go to Janazah, you go all of these different places, do all of these great things, just you being at home, being a good wife, you get the equivalent of all of that. You understand? No need to worry. You get the same reward that they get just by being in the home and doing what you do in the home. You get the same reward. SubhanAllah. So for the women who are struggling to breastfeed and wash dishes, make uh, dinner, uh, wash clothes, all of that, that's your jihad in the home. And you get the same reward as the men do. You understand? You get the same reward as the brothers get. The same exact reward. It is equivalent to all of that. So a man can go out and fight jihad and possibly lose his life in the process. And you're at home doing your own jihad. Washing dishes, breastfeeding children, getting kids ready for... You understand? No, you don't get half of his reward. That's not what he said. He didn't say half. He said, Ya'dilu dharika kulla. He said it is equivalent, equal to the reward that he gets for doing all of that. You understand? Not half. You get equivalent, equal to the reward that he gets for going out fighting jihad, visiting the sick, Attending the janazah prayer, getting up. Alhamdulillah, Muslim women don't have to go to the masjid five times a day. Muslim men do. Muslim men have to go pray in the masjid. 
That means that you 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 got to get up 5:30, a uh, half an hour early, make wudu, put your heavy coat on, go start your car, warm your car, and go to the masjid and pray. Muslim women don't have to do that. You can get up, make wudu, put your robe on, put your overgarment on, put your robe on top of your overgarment, go downstairs in your living room and go pray in the comfort of your home. Meanwhile, your husband got to start the car up, let the car warm up for 20 minutes, and then drive 20 minutes to the masjid, pray, and then come back home. You understand? And the Muslim woman still gets the same reward as the man. <laughs> you understand? She still gets the same reward as the man who has to go through all of that. And she got can simply get up, go in her bathroom, make wudu, put her overgarment on, put her robe on top of her overgarment and go downstairs and pray. You understand? She don't have to heat no car up. She don't have to wait out in front of the masjid until the imam shows up and opens the door. Right? It, don't have to sit in a cold masjid because they turn the, they turn the heat off at night. So when they come into the masjid during the, in, in the morning for Fajr, it's freezing in the masjid because now they got to turn the heat on. So you got to pray Salat to Fajr with your coat on, cold, freezing. You don't have to go through all of that. We do. As a Muslim woman, you don't have to go through all of that. We do. And you still get the same reward that we do for all of the trouble that we go through. You understand? This is Islam. This is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's made it easy on the women. The Prophet Sallallahu told her, go home, go back to all of the women and tell the women that, that sent you. The women that you came as a, as a delegate on behalf of those women, go back and tell them that if a woman is a good wife to her husband, good wife in the home, she gets the same reward as the husband and all of the things that he does. You get the same reward. So I want you sisters, I know it gets rough in the home, especially with, you know, Children being at home now more than they are at any other time. Children are at home. It seems like you are, you know, the husband, he has the luxury here again, the privilege of going out, going to work. And you got to work from home and you still got to manage the children. This one's on a laptop. This one's on a tablet. This one's on this. This one's on that. And you're trying to manage. You're trying to multitask. Wallahi, let me say to you, sisters, you have done an excellent job, man. If you didn't have anybody to tell you. You are doing an excellent job and you still get the reward as the men get for all of the trouble that they go through and going and handling what they handle outside of the home. Your jihad is in the home. And I know that some women are home alone with their children. and You don't have somebody to just kind of pat you on the back and say, good job. I'm saying that to you now. Great job. Keep up the good work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. But you you still get the same you still get the same reward. You still get the same reward. I I I I'm hurting that you know your homes three four five children running around the home and you managing all of that by yourself, man. You're managing all of that by yourself. You are doing a great job. You're doing an excellent job. This is my pat on your back. And your reward is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, you're not a single mother because you didn't make the children by yourself. You're not a single mother. It just so happens that he's a single father. He's the one that's not there. Stop putting yourself in the inferior position by saying single mother. You are not a single mother. You didn't ask to have children by yourself and raise them by yourself just so happens that when he divorced you, he divorced his children too. And that's, that's really sad, honestly. And I'm saying to the Muslim men, if you have children out there by women that you are no longer married to, man, go get your children, man. Pick your children up. Pick your children up, man. Give the mother of your children a break, man. Give the mother of your children a break, man. It's not fair that you get to go out and get remarried and live your best life and you leave this woman with three, four, five, six, seven children of yours whom you never come by to pick up and just say, hey, let me give her a break. Like, I mean, like, go get your kids, man. Go pick your children up. Take your children out. Even if it's just for, let me take you, go get you some, you know, some ice cream will take you, you know, just, just to kind of give your mom a break for a minute.
just to give them a break. But for the sisters who don't have that luxury, your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu said, go and inform, go educate all of the other women that are behind you that the exemplary spousal duties of one of your, uh, of one of you is equivalent, is equivalent, right, to all of what you mentioned about the rewards of the men. So. I'll stop there, inshallah, Ta'ala. I just wanted to kind of just, you know, uplift a little bit. And I know sometimes it can seem like I'm, I can be very harsh. I can be very hard. But you, you have to get all sides of me. All right. There's a side of me that and it's all coming from the same place. You understand? You, you get all sides of me. You don't get the nice Shadi Muhammad all the time. You don't get the mean Shadi Muhammad all the time. You get all sides of me. You, you got to get all of it because it's all coming from the same place. And that's love. It's all coming from the same place. You understand? So while sometimes it may seem like my me I'm sending mixed messages one minute, he's very harsh the next minute, he could be very soft. No, it's all coming from the same place. It's all coming from love. Love doesn't always come in the way that we like to hear it. You understand? It doesn't always come the way that we want it. But it's all coming from the same place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kathira. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.